I want to start with a really bad news. Um, a friend of us, a former Indaba speaker, Professor John Heskett, passed away two days ago, uh, Tuesday night. It's a tremendous loss for me, because he was a very good friend. For Denmark, because he actually defined our new, uh, how we treat design. But I also think for the whole world, for all designers, for all creative people, you know, this is a really loss. Um, over the last couple of months, we have tried to get all the stuff from John, um, and we'll open a we website in one or two days uh, when everything is secured by the family and by his friends. So I'd like you all to stand up in honor for John and clap for 15 seconds because I think, you know, he gave us so much. Thank you. So, let's rock and roll. Design is so much more than a chair. That's what we're going to speak about. I will start. Then we have a Vene, who is not looking very Danish. We have a few imports. And the next one looks like a Dane, and the one is sort of in the dream. So we will start, you know, with some uh, big things, and then we'll move into really hardcore things, and then actually we will end in the dreams, because even though we're changing the Danish design platform, we love lovable design, we have to have dreams, we have to drift away, you know, and just be cool. So this is about me, I've done a few of these, a uh, lot of stations, 21 stations uh, over the last 30 years, and you know, while I was doing them, I thought, you know, hmm, uh, maybe I should move into design, so I did that, I went into the Danish Design Center, started there a year, uh, two years ago, got a new strategy, and what really bothered me was that, you know, we were famous for this stuff, you know, uh, fantastic chairs, you know, when the chairs were not really selling, we just put another color on it. And then the sales went up again, but you know, they ran out of colors. <clears throat> and I, the, constantly I was thinking, what the hell are we doing? You know, is it actually giving any meaning? So I thought, um, maybe we should start designing for the 99% of people. Not for the 1%, but for the 99%. And I bet if we start designing for the 99% of people, it will help the 1%. And I was just imagining, you know, about this chair thing, you know, white coffee cup. You know, we, we are going to shape the future. And is the future a white coffee cup or a new nice chair or a sort of grayish couch? No, I think we should start, all the creatives here, should start designing a future where we maybe will need a chair. I'm not sure yet, but you know, depends on where we're going. So it's all about designing for the 99%. And when I was designing for a company, you know, the job was not going very well. I could feel this meeting was the end of the contract, uh, almost even before we got started. And we were talking, they said, we are doing luxury products. And I said, OK, what is a luxury product? And he pulled it back up and said, this is a luxury product. It costs 20,000 pounds. And I said, OK, is that a luxury product? That's not luxury. Then he put another one up and said, that was 40,000 pounds, and I was just, whoa. Then I said, do you know something? Before I leave, I'll tell you what a luxury product is, and it looks like this. This is a luxury product for the 99% of people. <clears throat> so maybe we as designers should start, you know, pulling our socks up, you know, do some design that gives meanings to people, that we can engage in, do the right questions, asking the why, you know, changing the question so it actually gives meaning to a lot of the people. And John, he, f he just phrased it like, design is the human capacity to shape and make our environments in ways that satisfies our needs and give meaning to our life. This is so clear. It opens up that design is not just for the designers, you know, the design designers, because if they continue designing our future, I don't think it will be a happy future. No, we have to get, you know, the astrophysics, even the accountants, the doctors, you, all of you, the 3,600 people, all the telecasts, to start thinking in a different future. Because we have a slight, you know, bumps on our way, we have a few challenges, and if we can do those things, then we can do chairs again. So I'm asking, don't design any more chairs, there's enough of them, no white coffee cups, let's design something just for 10 years that gives meaning. <clears throat> So I'm, I'm, I'm always working on these things, the now, what, you know, what are we going to do now? You know, 
So when I walk the streets of Cape Town, I see, oh, there's a lot of things we can start. And what will the new be? Like in five years, you know, we have to sit down, start talk to each other. You know, what, what will happen in five years? What will happen, you know, when we come out and the next, in 20 years, if we go like Ray Kurzweil, we, we'll have a computer in here doing everything, an avatar doing most of what we do, sensors everywhere. You know, maybe we should start designing the systems and not the gadgets. Because, you know, the, you can always design the gadget, but if you get the system right, you know, you're basically fucked. Sorry for my language. And, you know, one of the things that happened is that, you know, we just produce more and more, and I hope my kids will, you know, my grandchildren will not use the word waste. And the problem is this, that, you know, but prices on material have just been falling for 100 years. So we're producing more and more stuff, and suddenly in year 2000, it just shoots up. And that means that, you know, all the folks working things we've seen, you know, actually the asset is that folks working will, you know, lease your car, lease it out. They will not give it away or sell it because the asset is in there. Because what we've been doing is we take in natural resources, then we t take it away, you know, sail it all over the seas, then we make something, and then we basically throw it away and we have a lot of waste. That is not going to work. So we need to go into what I call the circular economy. We need to have to be divide stuff, you know, upscale it so a plastic bottle will, will go back in the system. You know, it, it's not about, you know, just uh, collecting stuff. No, they have to be on a higher level going up the ladder. And that's what it's all about. And if any of you have a French car, Renault, your engine block have been out running in like five years before you bought it. They take them back, change a few things, and off they go again. And it saves them a lot of money. It saves us a lot of material in the world. So that's how we should start thinking. We should start thinking totally different. You know, so it's not about just walking down the same way saying, oh, I, I, I'll do like, you know, I like to do something on royalties. No, you will not. And, you know, technology is creeping in everywhere. And the problem is we're living in it. So we don't see it. This is the Pope inauguration in 2005. And look at the idiot down at the right corner. Left corner. I go, no, that's right. I'm, you know, I'm right, left confused. It's left corner. That's one with a camera phone. She was the hippest person on the whole St. Peter Square. She had a camera phone. And you know what technology is? That's it. Eight years. <clears throat> we have them all over. We, did, we, we didn't even envisage that we got all this stuff. And it's just coming, you know. And we take it in, and some we throw out, but we, you know, so it's about designing the systems. When we have the system, then we can fill them up with gadgets. You know, now we're depending on Wi-Fi. There's no Wi-Fi in here. It's not working, then it's working. You know, it's just all these things, you know, and, you know, what are we going to do when you travel, roaming? You know, there's so many problems we have in our world. You know, can we just design systems where it's not going to be anything? So we have to ask the question, why? We have to start asking, you know, can we rephrase the questions we get? So when we, when we have clients asking us something, I always ask, why? Why should I do it? And if they can sort of say, oh, but it's because uh, we're in it for the money, then that's okay, that's fair. Then you say, no, I'm not in it for the money. If they come and say, well, this is how we do it, I think that would be cool. So you have to reimagine South Africa. I mean, you have to sit down and reimagine South Africa. We will reimagine Denmark because we have to move in a direction. And we don't know where it will lead us. But if all the creative people can start thinking and start talking, forming communities, forming design which actually engage you, then we can maybe actually save the planet because we're actually spending three and we just have one. So that will be a battle. It will be a tough one. But we have to remember to kiss each other because it's not going to be fun, all of it. But sometimes you just need a hug in the middle of the demonstration, you know, take your girlfriend, put her on the street, and, you know. <clears throat> so that's what, you, what I'm looking for. We need, still need love. We still need nice things around us. But we need to put them in a context where they actually give meaning to us and make sense. And this is... Sunita Williams, who was an astronaut, she took these images, and you know, this is, you know, you can see what that is, America, you know, there's lights on, you know, you have, you know, Asia, you know, Japan, you know, burning shit, like, on, Europe, and I just thought, why don't we switch the lights on in Africa? It's too dark. You know, it has to come the next time, you know, Sunita Williams' child is up there, 
she should be able to take photos where there's light in Africa. And I think it's so important that we start dealing with this problem and not the chair. So please, design like you give a damn. And then I'll leave it to you then. So, thanks, Nile. I run an innovation and design company in Copenhagen. I have a team which consists mostly of non-designers, just for starters. Uh, really clever computer science, math, statistics, whatnot, coming together, blending itself in a creative industry. We work with pixels, data, all that kind of stuff. But today, I'm going to tell you a different kind of story. Um, we've been going through debates on what is the future for design, and especially in the Danish context. And I want to show a different story here. I want to rewind a little bit to 1907, because something really important happened in New York. A Belgium chemist, um, he discovered Bakelite. This was an interesting moment in the history of design. No one talks about this, because it's not been captured in design history books. Bakelite changed the way products were designed forever. So one thing that happened was this new raw material sort of liberated product design in a totally new way because iconic products started coming out in free form in mass manufactured lightweight structures. Something like this phone from Ericsson was an epic phone because for the first time, a phone could be made out of a unibody structure, made lightweight, ergonomic, everything was thought through. So this phone is so significant, actually, that it has become an icon in a new way, because the receiver that you see here comes from there. Yeah. So the question is, what is a new raw material for us here? At this junction, almost a century later, what's the raw material that we should play with, us as creative people? And so I have a small hypothesis that the raw material is invisible, it's not tangible, it's not something you can hold in your hands, but we feel it every single day. And that is the story of data. And of course, it comes in all fashions and forms, big, small, medium, whatever size you want to. Um, don't fall for the buzzwords, but there's definitely something really intriguing about thinking about data as a raw material. It changes the perspective, it gives you a new lens to look at how to approach problem solving, opportunity seeking, and creating new systems and solutions. So I want to talk about a couple of quick cases We've done a lot of work for this big Danish, uh, one of the biggest Danish companies, Maersk Line, who ships containers all over the globe. And they've been living in the world of data forever, but in the form of pie charts and long tables and uh, dashboards and whatnot. So what we did was we took a lot of the data, their IBM-built data warehouse, and then we built amazing visualizations on top of it just to exemplify a really strong story as to what's going on, really. So. What happens in some cases like this, where we actually tell really powerful stories with data? This is the global container traffic for an entire year from S Klein. And it's really fascinating to see how the world of commerce actually operates. Here's where I need to use a pointer. Yeah. Um, this is the world's biggest container ships actually flying, uh, flying there in the waters. That, by the way, is and wide because of the Somalian pirates. Um, that is the world's biggest bottleneck in the world, Tanjan Palipas. And guess what happens over the Pacific? The ships all take the same amount of volume of traffic, but they take different routes because of optimization reasons, weather conditions, all kinds of interesting hard facts. But then we discovered something really intriguing here. We also discovered that the captains of the ship, they actually deviate from the original planned paths to gamify their lives. They uh, want to hop islands, they want to um, compete against each other, and there's so much to do because you're facing an open ocean for two weeks or something like that. Yeah. So that is just one example of how you can optimize an industry. Yeah. But there could be other really interesting things that you could do with data. So in Denmark, being a welfare state economy, a lot of emphasis is given on healthcare, of course. Uh, it's like on the newspapers almost every second day, and there's a lot of debate on that. Um, and there was something really interesting that happened uh, last year. Actually, Nile and I, we run this little uh, uh, data visualization academy, and as part of that, one of the projects came up with this uh, little visualization of uh, hospitalization rates. So this is a little complex, but I'll just spend a couple of seconds on this. That on the top 
is the um, axis of uh, January to December. This on the vertical axis is the ages. So here's where um, it's from infants all the way to really old people. It's really interesting because you can see a certain pattern here. The red color represents women and the blue color represents men. So guess what's happening here? It's pretty obvious to guess in the middle. It's sort of women giving birth. So a lot of hospitalizations and child, like people coming and giving birth to children. But what's happening down below there for men in the age group somewhere between 55 and 75, like close to retirement or post-retirement, it's a really big puzzle. We don't have an answer yet. There's a lot of hypothesis as to what's going on there. But this has massive impact on healthcare costs because the hypothesis here, more or less, is that men tend to procrastinate more about chronic conditions. So they end up in hospital with more severe conditions much later. Um, so if we were to tackle healthcare, at least in the Danish context, this probably needs to be in workplaces with men. Here's another example of what we're doing for um, the unemployment agency in uh, Copenhagen. Um, like every other European country right now, Denmark is also going through a yo-yo effect of the economy, and uh, there's a bit of a uh, crisis in terms of employing young people. So normally, there's a counseling session where a counselor explains what's the best career strategy to do, how do you write resumes, how do you find jobs, all that kind of stuff. But it's not very supportive, because the people who are there already know all this. There's nothing new to tell there. So we said, let's look at other alternate pathways for telling how to explain the story better to them. And there's this huge amount of data that's available on LinkedIn. So let's see what we can do by data mining LinkedIn. So what we did was, just as an example here, we mapped people's sort of career paths in terms of the educations that they get and the jobs that they have over time. So the red or the orange uh, represents educations of different degrees. Like the darker it gets, the higher it gets in terms of qualifications. And the blues kind of represent the, um, the jobs that they hold. So what we started doing was that, based on this sort of principle, we started data mining huge number of people. Um, and as a result, we started generating these uh, interesting patterns of visualizations out of these. And of course, because it is about huge number of data, we started extending this by a system of hopping networks. So we could hop uh, second degree and third degree networks and propagate through the whole system. And it sort of opens up into this um, huge amounts of patterns of what people are doing over time. And you can see there's actually a shift, a very interesting thing that's going on. People are getting jobs earlier and earlier in their careers. Uh, educations are actually getting shorter, but people want to get into the job market faster. So there's some really interesting patterns. This is just a really tiny sample of that whole thing. But then we started noticing certain strange things that were happening. And this is where the pattern recognition capability of, I think, creative thinking actually comes in place. Because we noticed that there were some unusual cases where people were getting, were not able to find jobs. People were simply unemployed for long periods, and they were often taking more and more education. And here's a small example of what's happening. This is just a few examples where people have actually taken more and more education, but somehow can't seem to find a job. So the state actually spends huge amounts of money trying to educate through free education people with the hope that they would find a good job and sort of be highly sort of engaged in the job market. But actually, it's counterintuitive. So this really raises a lot of questions. It's pretty controversial, of course. So this is just a hypothesis because we have not validated it through massive amounts of data yet. But it gives us a glimpse into whom we should go speak to, what kind of people, what kind of interviews, what kind of questions to ask whom. Anyways, so that is just one part of what we do. And data is an interesting currency because it can actually change people's lives. It can touch societies. And as Nili rightly said, we need to ask the right questions and solve the right problems. It's not just about uh, making more of the same. So an uh, interesting research thing that we do is called frugal digital, as in like we work with really low-cost, simple technologies to make this sort of data revolution come to life for emerging countries. So I want to take a small case that we do. Uh, in India, there's a system of ASHA workers. These are amazing foot soldiers who go door-to-door -door in villages, and they actually are the front line of healthcare in India. They're not trained as doctors or paramedical staff by any means. They usually have a high school degree. Um, 
but they have one very important role. They are the link between the healthcare system and the family. And they especially focus on maternal health, tuberculosis, um, lots of chronic diseases and stuff like that. So the only challenge being that the ASHA worker is this connecting sort of link between the family and a local public health center. And typically, this public health center is a good yeah, 7, 10, 15 kilometers away. So what happens is that if the person uh, in a family needs to take a person to a hospital or a clinic, they have to give up a whole day's wage, travel long distances, often on foot, creates a cascade of problems. But the funny thing is that the ASHA worker actually has the position and the role to actually influence and improve healthcare for them. So the challenge being that even if the person ends up in a healthcare center, there's typically extremely long waits. This is just one example, two doctors, 200 plus patients. How do you cope with this? This is a different scale of doing things. So we said there must be a better way of solving this. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to empower the ASHA worker. So the ASHA worker can give empathetic advice, which is fantastic. She also has contextual understanding as to what is the right time to go. Is it yeah, significant enough for an issue? What kind of treatment probably would help? And things like that. The only thing that the ASHA worker does not have is a decision support system based on data. And how do we bring that data revolution to the remotest of villages in the least possible cost is the important question there. So what we went about doing was that um, we said, let's do one thing. We have to empower the ASHA worker to screen health conditions better. So that is generate their own data and create some kind of a low cost and very rugged decision support system that sort of works offline, but still is able to give the right kind of advice in order to make some critical decisions, often life critical decisions. So what we did was that we looked around to see what is the most easily available resource in terms of technology around. Mobile phones is one thing, but no one is willing to spare their mobile phones because they're extremely expensive in any given context in these kinds of places. So we, we chanced upon this really silly little alarm clock. Yeah. It's a little $2 device that you can buy almost anywhere on this planet. But the beauty of this thing is that it has so many things in, inside it, and it's produced in such huge quantities that you can actually lower the cost very, very significantly. Well, so what we did was that we actually modified this alarm clock to do something more than just telling time. Uh, we made it into a medical screening tool. And what we did was that we took it apart, we implanted some sensors and a little microcontroller that had a little of clever software that was written in based on certain algorithms published by WHO. And what's really fascinating is that the alarm clock has these basic things in it. It has a battery, it has a power conditioning unit, it has a little motor that drives the needles. It's even got a buzzer so it can make sounds. Uh, it's a display. It's everything. All we had to do was put in this extra little chip in it that sort of gave it the intelligence required and the right context with the right software in it. So this is the demo of the clock hack converted into a pulse oximeter. So let's switch it on. It's ready. We need to set the needle at the start position. And we place our thumb on the sensor. And we can set the read button. So it goes and it's reading. Okay, so I'm in the green. So this is a really simple triage model. It's like a traffic light system. Uh, very basic. <laughs> so what it does is it crunches a lot of data in the background. Uh, the sensors are made of really cheap things. That's commonly available. We managed to do a whole bunch of sensors now. We moved an alarm clock into becoming a medical screening tool. Uh, with very little cost involved, and we empowered the ASHA worker with data. Significant data that can save lives, can change people, change societies. There's so much more significance in this. So we've been doing all kinds of field trials and tests with this, and today we managed to cover quite a lot of sensors. We have a pulse rate, body temperature, oxygen saturation. These are the basic ones. We can also capture respiration rate, pretty critical for pneumonia. The only thing that we are yet to crack, and if there's anyone here who's up for this, blood sugar is one of the most important issues right now. Diabetes is sweeping the globe. It's a big, big, massive challenge. We need to crack this one because 
timely measurements and detecting diabetes, pre-diabetic condition, is the single biggest challenge right now in healthcare. Uh, the global sort of scene on diabetes is just exploding through the roof. Bad food everywhere, expensive, good food. You can understand how cheap it is to get fats and carbohydrates in your lives. Um, it's affecting the poorest of the poor in a very big way. So just to finish off, my take on design at least is that I think design has moved beyond the artifact or the service offering. Uh, it's really about an approach to create holistic experiences and coping with systemic complexity, because systemic complexity is one thing that creative industry is yet to crack properly. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you, Vinay, and thank you to you all. It's uh, absolutely amazing to stand here in front of you. I think over the past few days, we've really seen some mind-blowing new takes on design. We're playing on the the big guitar of design, so to say. I'm, I'm going to put another string on it today. And I hope you're not like fed up with uh, listening to you know, healthcare stories and so on. I think they're very, very important. But before we dive in, I just like to, I, I split my 12 minutes into an ad block of one minute and then 11 minutes of a great case that I'm going to share with you. So live with the ad block first, but it will give you an idea of my background and uh, how we go about design and what we work with. We are Design It. It can be everything. It is inside every product. It is behind every service. It comes after each tap. It lives in every showroom. <laughs> the experience. Design It is a strategic design firm. We look for the junction between human desire, technology, and business. At Design It, we explore and we challenge. It can be an insulin pen changing diabetes treatment. It can be the time-saving self-service of mobile banking. It can be late night shopping, branding a nation, logging in, checking out, going home, or controlling 40 industrial pumps from your phone. From our 15 offices around the world, we design products and services for the future. We believe that every touch point between a business and its customers is an opportunity. At Design It, we will go beyond the conventional design process and bridge the gap between strategy and reality, between the business of today and the customers of tomorrow. Together with our clients, we explore it, we build it, and we break it down to improve it. Again and again until everyone loves it. Design It, strategic design firm. All right. So um, it probably shines uh, through that we are product guys, product makers way back. Uh, uh, but we've learned that you know, products, they don't die, but increasingly they turn digital. And really that the big challenge is not the product as, su as such and the usability of them, but you know, products merging into bigger systems, larger systems, you know them, airport security, stuff like that. Somehow, you know, I don't know what's happening on this planet. We have the ability of designing things so thoroughly that we kind of end up messing it up, right? We get tangled up in technology in a way. So what we're trying to do with our take on design is really trying to convince you know, the industry that the fastest way going from a need or a challenge to a solution that actually works is spanning the bow, so to say, and rethink things. Have a bit of patience in the beginning. Get at a stage where you can start like, you know, really rethinking, is this the right problem I'm trying to solve? We don't want to pour a lot of design on, on, the wrong solu on, on uh, solving the wrong problems, right? So what we're saying here is basically that bridging this, you know, the thinking and the doing bit in a very simple way, this is what we use design for. Last year, uh, Oslo University Hospital approached us. It's one of the largest hospitals in Scandinavia, has more than 20,000 employees, uh, a lot of new equipment, etc., and have a lot of big problems as well. For example, this extremely long waiting list for breast cancer patients actually at a stage where it started to become illegal because, you know, when society promises something, it, it, it's got to hold its promises, right? So they came to us with a quite clear brief, and I think that's excellent, you know, when a client comes to you always, um, already having realized what's the problem, right? So we didn't, as we heard one of the other speakers say the other day, you know, you start breaking the brief. We didn't do that because we think actually creating a better experience for breast cancer patients made a lot of sense. It's a very open brief um, so we kind of um, dug into that, and I'm going to show you what the project looked like. But before we do that, I'm going to share some facts 
because I was pretty, I was pretty amazed to learn how, actually how big a disease and the condition breast cancer is. So it's the most common cancer in women, uh, the cancer form in women for all over the world. One out of eight women will be diagnosed in their lifetime. And with, uh, you know, with death of half a million, it, it's a, pretty, it's a pre pretty serious matter. And, you know, as opposed to common belief, a lot of these, uh, you know, cancer deaths happen in, de happens in developed countries. Um, and early detection, really, and diagnosis, this whole setup, it's crucial. And it's actually one of the easy things to make work. It's not curing anything, but it's something that we as designers actually can fix to bring down, uh, you know, waiting time. So what we started out this process with the uh, Oslo University Hospitals, I think they were a bit fed up, you know, they said with consultants in suits, uh, trying to tell them to make everything lean, cut away processes, etc. So we defined quite, quite early on that this process, we wanted to work as management consultants. That's a huge field, right? But we want to be management consultants with warm hands and hearts, right? We just don't want to cut away things. It's not what it's all about. It's about delivering this, you know, a better patient experience. We split it into very simple uh, phases, work tasks in a way, because we want always to have our client on board and have the end users on board. We shouldn't make stuff too academic, because if we do that, people just don't engage in it. And we need that our clients, in this case a hospital, uh, the team at the hospital, and end users, that they engage. Because very often, they know the problem far better than we do. They know where the stone in the shoe is. So we rely heavily on their insights and creativity. First of all, when we dug into this, we realized, and that, that's a no-brainer, right? You can't work at work. Somebody said, and I think it's true, noise and interruptions somehow just like, you know, s s rip your workday apart. Patients calling in all the time, etc. One of the other bottlenecks we saw was really that, you know, making all these scans wasn't really the big problem. They could do that in time, but analyzing them, and most of all, evaluating, prioritizing them, so that the serious cases kind of got in front row, was a real serious bottleneck that caused a lot of, it was a root cause for a lot of other, um, you know, uh, bad things happening later on in this uh, system. And then, that's a classic one, you know that yourself, don't you? this bad first impression. Everything from the letters patients received, the, the tone of voice, the layout, to the waiting rooms, just a very, very bad first impression. And as you see this quote, I think it's quite, uh, it's quite you know, uh, remarkable that it reminds of, you know, like a, of, of a graveyard. It's really serious, this, right? Then another thing that dawned on us when we start talking to, to uh, patients was, Waiting time is killing people. It, is, it really is. Everybody said so. So kind of that led us to the next insight, really. Uh, and, and also one of the other big problems were, if people are waiting and they're getting frustrated, they feel that kept, you know, they are like being kept in the dark, what do they do? They take charge, right? They go to their own doctor, have extra scans made at, at the private clinics. They call in all the time. They show up on the hospital, knocking on the front door saying, what is happening? Where am I in the system? Etc. I think we all realize, or, or, you know, we, we've tried this. When we get lost somehow, we've got to take action, right? This kind of led us to an, really one of the key insights in this project is that, you know, this whole gap between being referred from your doctor and getting into the system. So for a woman, she becomes a patient the moment she discovers a lump in her breast. But for the hospital, it's different. She doesn't become a patient until she's diagnosed. And this gap of many, many weeks is a serious thing, right? And that's also what causes people, you know, calling in, showing up without appointments, just because they want to know if something is happening. So, based on these insights, really the big finding was that we need to redefine this whole thing, uh, you know, that, how that system works. We defined this pilot project called the New Breast Cancer Diagnostic Center. And uh, this is actually what we're working on with Oslo and University Hospital right now, but we, we were allowed to share this work in progress. What we did, just to give you like, some insights in the process, obviously we needed to map the patient journey first to understand what happens, when, and who's involved. It's a pretty you know, systematic, analytical process based on the insights. And again, you, you invite patients on board to help, them, uh, to help us you know, uh, figure out how this works. Next thing we did was really trying to uh, design the different use cases, you know, the touch points, what happens when you meet up at the front desk the first time, etc. 
We had to go through a lot of different use cases with a lot of different personnel, from radiologist to the patient coordinator, etc., which is a new function at the hospital now, the patient coordinator, to share with them, you know, how this future in terms of, say, customer experience or patient experience should look like. And visualization is really a very, very powerful way of doing this because you get everyone on board. You don't do that with a lot of Word documents. You probably know, right? Like a lot of standard operating procedures. And I think in this process, a lot of these people realized that they're really good at handling hospitals, handling procedures. They got to learn how to handle people, patients, right? That's a big, big difference. So what we managed to do in this was to get the waiting time at up to 12 weeks to get that down into just four days. And for the ones that are not diagnosed with cancer, it's only three days. It's a massive improvement. Without any, you know, fancy apps, technology, high-tech, mainly based on new ways of collaborating, communicating, and coordinating things, uh, how they happen in this, like, you know, perfect hospital. So these are the, just a bit of data vis visualization, not a, as a sophisticated as yours, as yours Vinay, but uh, so going from 84 days of uncertainty of waiting time down to four days, that's an improvement of 90%. And you know what? That's a... Thank you very much. That's something that, you know, a hospital uh, manager understands, right? That a team leader understands. So getting these small successes, right? Not trying to cover the whole, you know, uh, thing, just bring down the waiting time. I think that is going to give us the next project and as such enable us to have even more impact. So I think three very important uh, things came out of this uh, kind of, you know, side products. And uh, these are three things that Oslo uh, University Hospital keep reminding themselves. First of all, the service promise. As their patient, you can feel confident that you're in their care from the moment you leave your doctor. It sounds stupid, but it's a new thing, actually. You're not left sitting in that void, being you know, frustrated and, and anxious. The second one was a big realization of really the need of refocusing the hospital, the system, to wrap it around the patient instead of the other way around. And I think that goes for any kind of you know, technology, systems, etc. they're made for us, not the other way around. And the third one was a mind shift, and that was actually from the team leader of this. He said, and I think that's a wonderful quote, you know what I realized? We need to get used to asking the healthcare system's overlooked group of experts, the patients. And that didn't come from us, that came from the, you know, the lead of the, uh, the project team. So basically, uh, this is the end of my presentation. I want to finish off with this one, just taking this whole user experience uh, forward. I think the world, you know, we're, we're plumbing it with IT, sophisticated solutions, and not all of it works. There's so much stuff that we need to fix out there. And I think designers are good at fixing all this crappy stuff, really. Some of it, you know, we do invisible solutions, not very fancy, but damn useful. And I think we should be so proud of it, really. So what we want to go for is really, you know, bring the user experience up that ladder and that at least satisfied or maybe even at excited, right? And that makes a lot of business for institutions, uh, you know, businesses, et cetera, because if you're happy and excited as a customer, you spread the word, right? So let's, there's a lot of wood to be chopped. Let's dig in, okay? Um, hello. Uh, I kind of have a little problem because I really need to pee. Uh, so I think um, maybe I'm going to sit down and maybe if I'm feeling really comfy, then maybe I'll get back on my feet. There's a lot of creative persons here. They could think about, you know, um, think about that problem. You know, you sit here in South Africa and you really need to pee and you have, I have 12 minutes and I'm using one minute talking about peeing. <clears throat> Anyway, my name is Henrik Wipskow. I'm uh, educated from Central St. Martins uh, in the UK. I'm educated in menswear. I've been playing music since I was 10, uh, drums, and that's becoming a few 32 years. And I do a lot of exhibitions uh, like that. You can see where I'm creating uh, spaces uh, with textiles. So I'm, I'm working kind of a lot with textiles. Uh, and 
And just uh, kind of listening to those guys now who have all been talking about, uh, I've got nearly a bit afraid of calling myself a designer uh, because I'm not doing any hospital uh, projects or uh, <clears throat> I'm, it's more artistic maybe. Anyway, I'm doing the fashion thing. Uh, educated in the uh, in the in the menswear from there, I've been doing around 25 shows in uh, Paris on the menswear um, official schedule. I'm part of the Champs Passion de Calme, which is a round table in Paris where they're sitting uh, 12 really important people, and uh, I'm sitting there as the only one of those big houses. And I can't speak French anyway, um, and I've got no clue what's going on. I have a shop in New York. I have one in Copenhagen. I'm uh, teaching. I'm a professor. I've uh, been teaching at St. Martin's, Antwerp, and quite a lot of European schools. I do quite a lot of exhibitions. Uh, I, I, I'm having my two own stores and a web store, and then I'm selling uh, in around like 40 different countries. Music-wise, yeah, I've been playing for 32 years. I've got, I'm a drummer. I got a drum kit when I was uh, um, 10, and I've and, uh, been playing on pretty many big stages from Glastonbury, all the right places you have to do if you want to be a musician. I've been playing there just as a drummer. I've uh, um, been having the pee problem before in front of a big, bigger audience than here. Um, but uh, you kind of deal with it. What was it I had to talk about? Oh, I've been doing all that music thing. Uh, music has been one, like there was a lot of identity towards how the music thing was going on for me and how I, when I was a teenager, suddenly there was different uh, codes and signals in that little group of uh, our music. We had a certain style, you had to wear that. There was also something about the books, which films you had to do. And I suddenly realized that there was a lot about uh, identity and characters and in the whole music thing, which kind of led me kind of into the whole uh, clothing business, where I think it's most of uh, the most important thing is like how clothing is maybe maybe still one of the fastest communicators. How we are sending code signals to what we wear, to how we are uh, performing, to how we appear, and it's still maybe still the internet is getting pretty uh, fast. Uh, but it's still you know you can go into a room like here and maybe suddenly without actually been talking to anyone you get attracted or you get uh, interested in a person without actually knowing anything. That's a good reason for me for doing it, the, the communication thing. Music-wise, it's maybe one of the first, um, like doing the clothing, it's one of the first thing, maybe one of the first products for the mankind. Music, drumming instrument was maybe one of the first instruments for the mankind. Uh, creating those textile spaces could actually be put into... And then yesterday I went into one of the, the townships here. I actually skipped some part of the conference and I went on a little trip. And I got out there and I noticed, of course, uh, there was some really big problems towards no water, electricity. Uh, I don't know if there was mobile connection out there. Uh, there was a lot of things that could be solved with things we've been hearing about today and there could be numbers and registrations but I also noticed that some of those really important things for, for the people out there was actually also um, appearance having a really nice space cleaned and actually be able to uh, look nice or appear nice towards maybe your friends or your neighbors so uh, even though that they were missing all kind of things uh, actually clothing and appearing was really, really important part of their life, which were, I think, interesting. Because, of course, there was a lot more bigger needs. I'm also here, to, I thought it could be nice to talk a bit about my creative process, and there's a lot of slides running through there. I use uh, in my process of being creative, uh, whatever ever I'm building an exhibition or uh, signing a collection, I used mistakes and, and faults a lot, like how in the creative uh, projects, uh, how you suddenly uh, ending up with a wrong color or a supplier is sending yellow and it was supposed to be a, a rusty brown pantone and you get a completely thing and how you have to deal with it. And maybe sometimes, and that's what's really interesting and I think what's important for, for, for some of the young people here is that you can actually, mistakes and faults are really important for the human mind to be uh, uh, creative because um, if you just go from A to B, then you're becoming a bit computerish, and uh, 
the, dread, uh, the dress has to look A-shaped and red, but what about if it was suddenly rusty brown and circle formed? And maybe suddenly it had a... Maybe suddenly there was a purpose, maybe there suddenly was stuff that you didn't uh, plan to, that actually in the end, maybe the mistakes and the faults was actually making a better perspective of that whole project. And if you've just, if you've just been working on the, the plan and no zigzaggy or off track, if you've just been in straight line, maybe it, maybe the gen, like kind of genius elements or perspective of being a creation person actually comes from wrong thoughts or D tracks or going the wrong way or suddenly in a movie uh, when you're recording suddenly there's uh, the waitress be be behind the bar who's just having a little role suddenly is so great that suddenly for that film he's becoming a main um, actor and actually he's making the film to actually being a really really great film and in, in my de design pro process I, I try to I try to be very structured, and I'm not, and it's chaotic, and no, no, no. But I try, you know. And uh, A to B, and no, no, we have to do it in time, and we're sitting here, no, 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 no. And then suddenly there's something happening, or a neighbor is dropping by and spilled coffee all over, or crashes computer. And sometimes I'm also waiting a bit for those uh, things to happen, you know, just sitting and waiting, like, hey, let's, like, okay, I'm designing clothing products, a cardigan three buttons, four buttons, you know, it's not the biggest questions uh, <laughs> for my brain to, to, to deal with. But maybe, uh, the, like, things could happen. And I've been trying different things where, like, different projects where suddenly, completely, everything went completely wrong. And uh, this is a drumming music machine, you saw. And, uh, and uh, we were creating a big, uh, like, a piano, and the models was walking down, as you see. They were supposed to do only acoustic sounds from those drums. Now it's further on. But the drums, actually, we, we were looking into how to build cheap drums, and we were looking into some uh, townships in Brazilian, how they created, and heating up plastic that was swinking. And we were working, and we made 100 drums, and it was looking great uh, on the computer, and we would do a 3D sketch up, and it was like perfect. But the drums didn't say much. Uh, and I was like, whoa, okay, we're going to Paris, and there's going to be like 2,000 people. Um, maybe we could. And then we employed, and that actually maybe made the project better uh, because we made some triggers into it. So it was acoustic, but then triggered by the models walking down that uh, piano or whatever drum system. That triggered uh, um, like um, some uh, electronic sounds. So it was kind of a mystic. Uh, a mix of acoustic and um, electronic triggers. Uh, another project, I had this, uh, you know, I was, uh, I'm doing this in Paris and there's a lot of press and people are expecting a lot and I was a little bit, you have, um, I have to create project, uh, products within every uh, six months, which is uh, ridiculous. Maybe they could last for at least, uh, you know, maybe it could be one, two years, and you can go to a beach in between or something. Uh, but I, and it's also, you know, you have to do to be a creative person, and you have to present something completely crazy. And and I thought about um, many of my the things you just quickly saw. There's not much uh, uh, sexuality or sex involved, and I'm not maybe not the most sexy person either. Uh, I thought, hey, maybe we should do something like about some big, wet, shiny boobies. <laughs> and um, it was just like a little thought. And every time I was like, hey, I'm thinking about doing something really off track, really oily, wet boobies. Uh, and I could see every time when I was talking to or explaining what are you working on, I'm working on this. Uh, and I could see like this touch in the eye, and people were smiling. And it was like some hardcore punkers that was like, yeah. To businessmen, there was like, yeah. <laughs> to, uh, to also like teenagers, like, yeah. And my mom was like, whoa, uh, boobies. <laughs> um, I, I thought, okay, let's like present, let's do a presentation with mountains of boobies. Uh, and the models, they're gonna lie in the boobies. And, and we produced uh, foam boobies, you can see like here. Uh, 
uh, like phone and we was like, okay, we have two months, every 10 minutes, we like, we have three forms and foam. And then after two months or 10 minutes, da -da -da, we were going to have 2,000, 3,000 boobies. It's going to be a mountain. And in the end, the mountain was not really happening. And we were going to the Paris the day after, we was like, okay, this is our mountain, fuck. And we <laughs> was like, what are we going to do, uh, mountain, uh, boobies? Uh, um, and it was the perspective, the whole collection was the perspective of Mother Earth. We all been there, um, getting milk, most of us. Uh, sexuality, there was all kind of different projects, uh, perspectives, uh, religious, uh, culture, on that booby collection. And now we were standing with this, uh, there was no mountain, it was just like a little... Uh, and we had uh, 40 models and then this little... Uh, okay, there was 2,000 of them. Okay, what can we do? We have 24 hours. Uh, we put all the boobies on sticks. So it became, and we put all models under the sticks, uh, so it was kind of becoming more like a Garden of Eden and uh, paradise, and there was a new perspective to all this that suddenly, uh, you know, maybe it's many years ago, but, you know, when I did it, I did the show in, uh, in Copenhagen, uh, Paris first, there was like a... It was a good vibe about the boobies, you know. And when I did it in Copenhagen, that's always two months after where I put some women's wear into it, there was like a, a lot of, uh, like a queue of 2,000 people who has to go and see that. Now I have to ask a few guys uh, just to come in and help me. Some friends I got here, if they're still around. And I don't know, maybe we should, I don't know if we need to move the bends a bit. Uh, it's just like a little another project, and it's like a bit risk and do, try to do stuff. Uh, uh, I still need to pee anyway. Uh, um, this is some guys, some friends of me, uh, in some uh, stuff I've been doing. Uh, the, the, the skirt is from a female collection, but it works out. The guys look great. I was just thinking, because we've been, we've been, thank you guys. Um, we've been um, we've been th seeing a lot of projects. There's been slides going on and, uh, and people have been talking about hospitals and uh, cops and I need to pee and glasses and you know there's a lot of problems. Uh, but I thought maybe it could be nice and try to do something, but it's a little bit out of control. Uh, um, and I've been use working a lot with um, uh, air and textiles. And I'm just like, I thought maybe it could be good to put some three-dimensional into this stage because you've been sitting for three days and just like slides going on. Um, so this is a project uh, called the Mind Institute. It's also uh, like a backdrop from an old show I did. Uh, it was the idea of just starting researching in the color mint. Uh, and it's like, okay, how does mint music look like? How does the mint food, uh, is there mint structure? Could we do a mint dance? Uh, could we create a blown up mint structure? Um, so just something that was a little bit out of, and it was like very difficult to control air and fabric. Yeah, it takes a while. <laughs> I could go peeing. <laughs> but uh, I, think, uh, I think it would continue blowing up and um, and then, thanks. <laughs> okay.